Chapter Thirty. Marshal Hulot, being obliged to live in a style suited to the highest military rank, had taken a handsome house in the Rue du Montparnasse, where there are three or four princely residences. Though he rented the whole house, he inhabited only the ground floor. When Lisbeth went to keep house for him, she at once wished to let the first floor, which, as she said, would pay the whole rent, so that the Count would live almost rent-free, but the old soldier would not hear of it. For some months past the Marshal had had many sad thoughts. He had guessed how miserably poor his sister-in-law was, and suspected her griefs without understanding their cause. The old man, so cheerful in his deafness, became taciturn. He could not help thinking that his house would one day be a refuge for the baroness and her daughter, and it was for them that he kept the first floor. The smallness of his fortune was so well known at headquarters that the war minister, the Prince de Wissembourg, begged his old comrade to accept a sum of money for his household expenses this sum the marshal spent in furnishing the ground floor which was in every way suitable for as he said he would not accept the marshal's baton to walk the streets with the house had belonged to a senator under the empire and the ground floor drawing-rooms had been very magnificently fitted with carved wood white and gold still in very good preservation the marshal had found some good old furniture in the same style in the coach-house he had a carriage with two batons in saltire on the panels, and when he was expected to appear in full fig at the minister's, at the Tuileries, for some ceremony or high festival, he hired horses for the job. His servant for more than thirty years was an old soldier of sixty, whose sister was the cook, so he had saved ten thousand francs, adding it by degrees to a little hoard he intended for Hortense every day the old man walked along the boulevard from the rue de montparnasse to the rue plumet and every pensioner as he passed stood at attention without fail to salute him then the marshal rewarded the veteran with a smile who is the man you always stand at attention to salute said a young workman one day to an old captain and pensioner i will tell you boy replied the officer the boy stood resigned as a man does to listen to an old gossip in eighteen hundred and nine said the captain we were covering the flank of the main army marching on vienna under the emperor's command we came to a bridge defended by three batteries of cannon one above another on a sort of cliff three redoubts like three shelves and commanding the bridge we were under marshal massena that man whom you see there was colonel of the grenadier guards and i was one of them our columns held one bank of the river the batteries were on the other three times they tried for the bridge and three times they were driven back go and find hulot said the marshal nobody but he and his men can bolt that morsel so we came the general who was just retiring from the bridge stopped hulot under fire to tell him how to do it and he was in the way i don't want advice but room to pass said our general coolly marching across at the head of his men and then rattle thirty guns raking us at once by heaven cried the workman that accounts for some of these crutches and if you like me my boy had heard those words so quietly spoken you would bow before that man down to the ground it is not so famous as arcol but perhaps it was finer we followed hulot at the double right up to those batteries all honor to those we left there and the old man lifted his hat the austrians were amazed at the dash of it the emperor made the man you saw a count he honored us all by honoring our leader and the king of to-day was very right to make him a marshal hurrah for the marshal cried the workman oh you may shout shout away the marshal is as deaf as a post from the roar of cannon this anecdote may give some idea of the respect with which the invalide regarded marshal hulot whose republican proclivities secured him the popular sympathy of the whole quarter of the town 
sorrow taking hold on a spirit so calm and strict and noble was a heart-breaking spectacle the baroness could only tell lies with a woman's ingenuity to conceal the whole dreadful truth from her brother-in-law in the course of this miserable morning the marshal who like all old men slept but little had extracted from lisbeth full particulars as to his brother's situation promising to marry her as the reward of her revelations any one can imagine with what glee the old maid allowed the secrets to be dragged from her which she had been dying to tell ever since she had come into the house for by this means she made her marriage more certain your brother is incorrigible lisbeth shouted into the marshal's best ear her strong clear tones enabled her to talk to him but she wore out her lungs so anxious was she to prove to her future husband that to her he would never be deaf he has had three mistresses said the old man and his wife was an adeline poor adeline if you will take my advice shrieked lisbeth you will use your influence with the prince de wissembourg to secure her some suitable appointment she will need it for the baron's pay is pledged for three years i will go to the war office said he and see the prince to find out what he thinks of my brother and ask for his interest to help my sister think of some place that is fit for her the charitable ladies of paris in concert with the archbishop have formed various beneficent associations they employ superintendents very decently paid whose business it is to seek out cases of real want such an occupation would exactly suit dear adeline it would be work after her own heart send to order the horses said the marshal i will go and dress i will drive to neuilly if necessary how fond he is of her she will always cross my path wherever i turn said lisbeth to herself lisbeth was already supreme in the house but not with the marshal's cognizance she had struck terror into the three servants for she had allowed herself a housemaid and she exerted her old maidish energy in taking stock of everything examining everything and arranging in every respect for the comfort of her dear marshal lisbeth quite as republican as he could be pleased him by her democratic opinions and she flattered him with amazing dexterity for the last fortnight the old man whose house was better kept and who was cared for as a child by its mother had begun to regard lisbeth as a part of what he had dreamed of my dear marshal she shouted following him out on to the steps pull up the windows do not sit in a draught to oblige me the marshal who had never been so cosseted in his life went off smiling at lisbeth though his heart was aching at the same hour baron hulot was quitting the war office to call on his chief marshal the prince de wissembourg who had sent for him though there was nothing extraordinary in one of the generals on the board being sent for hulot's conscience was so uneasy that he fancied he saw a cold and sinister expression in mitouflet's face mitouflet how is the prince he asked locking the door of his private room and following the messenger who led the way he must have a crow to pluck with you monsieur le baron replied the man for his face is set at stormy hulot turned pale and said no more he crossed the anteroom and reception rooms and with a violently beating heart found himself at the door of the prince's private study the chief at this time seventy years old with perfectly white hair and the tanned complexion of a soldier of that age commanded attention by a brow so vast that imagination saw in it a field of battle under this dome crowned with snow sparkled a pair of eyes of the napoleon blue usually sad-looking and full of bitter thoughts and regrets their fire overshadowed by the penthouse of the strongly projecting brow this man bernadotte's rival had hoped to find his seat on a throne but those eyes could flash formidable lightnings when they expressed strong feelings 
then his voice always somewhat hollow rang with strident tones when he was angry the prince was a soldier once more he spoke the language of lieutenant cotin he spared nothing nobody hulot d'ervy found the old lion his hair shaggy like a mane standing by the fireplace his brows knit his back against the mantel-shelf and his eyes apparently fixed on vacancy here at your orders prince said hulot affecting a graceful ease of manner the marshal looked hard at the baron without saying a word during the time it took him to come from the door to within a few steps of where the chief stood this leaden stare was like the eye of god hulot could not meet it he looked down in confusion he knows everything said he to himself does your conscience tell you nothing asked the marshal in his deep hollow tones it tells me sir that i have been wrong no doubt in ordering razzias in algeria without referring the matter to you at my age and with my tastes after forty-five years of service i have no fortune you know the principles of the four hundred elect representatives of france those gentlemen are envious of every distinction they have pared down even the minister's pay that says everything ask them for money for an old servant what can you expect of men who pay a whole class so badly as they pay the government legal officials who give thirty sous a day to the laborers on the works at toulon when it is a physical impossibility to live there and keep a family on less than forty sous who never think of the atrocity of giving salaries of six hundred francs up to a thousand or twelve hundred perhaps to clerks living in paris and who want to secure our places for themselves as soon as the pay rises to forty thousand who finally refuse to restore to the crown a piece of crown property confiscated from the crown in eighteen thirty property acquired too by louis the sixteenth out of his privy purse if you had no private fortune prince you would be left high and dry like my brother with your pay and not another sou and no thought of your having saved the army and me with it in the boggy plains of poland you have robbed the state you have made yourself liable to be brought before the bench at assizes said the marshal like that clerk of the treasury and you take this monsieur with such levity but there is a great difference monseigneur cried the baron have i dipped my hands into a cash-box entrusted to my care when a man of your rank commits such an infamous crime said the marshal he is doubly guilty if he does it clumsily you have compromised the honor of our official administration which hitherto has been the purest in europe and all for two hundred thousand francs and a hussy said the marshal in a terrible voice you are a councillor of state and a private soldier who sells anything belonging to his regiment is punished with death here is a story told to me one day by colonel pourin of the second lancers at saverne one of his men fell in love with a little alsatian girl who had a fancy for a shawl the jade teased this poor devil of a lancer so effectually that though he could show twenty years service and was about to be promoted to be quartermaster the pride of the regiment to buy this shawl he sold some of his company's kit do you know what this lancer did baron d'ervy he swallowed some window-glass after pounding it down and died in eleven hours of an illness in hospital try if you please to die of apoplexy that we may not see you dishonored hulot looked with haggard eyes at the old warrior and the prince reading the look which betrayed the coward felt a flush rise to his cheeks his eyes flamed will you sir abandon me hulot stammered marshal hulot hearing that only his brother was with the minister ventured at this juncture to come in and like all deaf people went straight up to the prince oh cried the hero of poland i know what you are here for my old friend but we can do nothing do nothing echoed marshal hulot who had heard only the last word 
nothing you have come to intercede for your brother but do you know what your brother is my brother asked the deaf man yes he is a damned infernal blackguard and unworthy of you the marshal in his rage shot from his eyes those fulminating fires which like napoleon's broke a man's will and judgment you lie cotin said marshal hulot turning white throw down your baton as i throw mine i am ready the prince went up to his old comrade looked him in the face and shouted in his ear as he grasped his hand are you a man you will see that i am well then pull yourself together you must face the worst misfortune that can befall you the prince turned round took some papers from the table and placed them in the marshal's hands saying read that the comte de Fortsheim read the following letter which lay uppermost to his excellency the president of the council private and confidential algiers my dear prince we have a very ugly business on our hands as you will see by the accompanying documents the story briefly told is this baron hulot d'ervy sent out to the province of oran an uncle of his as a broker in grain and forage and gave him an accomplice in the person of a storekeeper this storekeeper to curry favor has made a confession and finally made his escape the public prosecutor took the matter up very thoroughly seeing as he supposed that only two inferior agents were implicated but johann fischer uncle to your chief of the commissariat department finding that he was to be brought up at the assizes stabbed himself in prison with a nail that would have been the end of the matter if this worthy and honest man deceived it would seem by his agent and by his nephew had not thought proper to write to baron hulot this letter seized as a document so greatly surprised the public prosecutor that he came to see me now the arrest and public trial of a councillor of state would be such a terrible thing of a man high in office too who has a good record for loyal service for after the barasina it was he who saved us all by reorganizing the administration that i desired to have all the papers sent to me is the matter to take its course now that the principal agent is dead will it not be better to smother up the affair and sentence the storekeeper in default the public prosecutor has consented to my forwarding the documents for your perusal the baron hulot d'ervy being resident in paris the proceedings will lie with your supreme court we have hit on this rather shabby way of ridding ourselves of the difficulty for the moment only my dear marshal decide quickly this miserable business is too much talked about already and it will do as much harm to us as to you all if the name of the principal culprit known at present only to the public prosecutor the examining judge and myself should happen to leak out at this point the letter fell from marshal hulot's hands he looked at his brother he saw that there was no need to examine the evidence but he looked for johann fischer's letter and after reading it at a glance held it out to hector from the prison at oran dear nephew when you read this letter i shall have ceased to live be quite easy no proof can be found to incriminate you when i am dead and your jesuit of a chardin fled the trial must collapse the face of our adeline made so happy by you makes death easy to me now you need not send the two hundred thousand francs good-bye this letter will be delivered by a prisoner for a short term whom i can trust i believe johann fischer i beg your pardon said marshal hulot to the prince de wissembourg with pathetic pride come come say too not the formal of you replied the minister clasping his old friend's hand the poor lancer killed no one but himself he added with a thunderous look at hulot d'ervy how much have you had said the comte de Fortsheim to his brother two hundred thousand francs my dear friend said the count addressing the minister 
you shall have the two hundred thousand francs within forty-eight hours it shall never be said that a man bearing the name of hulot has wronged the public treasury of a single sou what nonsense said the prince i know where the money is and i can get it back send in your resignation and ask for your pension he went on sending a double sheet of foolscap flying across to where the councillor of state had sat down by the table for his legs gave way under him to bring you to trial would disgrace us all i have already obtained from the superior board their sanction to this line of action since you can accept life with dishonor in my opinion the last degradation you will get the pension you have earned only take care to be forgotten the minister rang is marneffe the head clerk out there yes monseigneur show him in you said the minister as marneffe came in you and your wife have wittingly and intentionally ruined the baron d'ervy whom you see monsieur le ministre i beg your pardon we are very poor i have nothing to live on but my pay and i have two children and the one that is coming will have been brought into the family by monsieur le baron what a villain he looks said the prince pointing to marneffe and addressing marshal hulot no more of scanarelle's speeches he went on you will disgorge two hundred thousand francs or be packed off to algiers but monsieur le ministre you do not know my wife she has spent it all monsieur le baron asked six persons to dinner every evening fifty thousand francs a year are spent in my house leave the room said the minister in the formidable tones that had given the word to charge in battle you will have notice of your transfer within two hours go i prefer to send in my resignation said marneffe insolently for it is too much to be what i am already and thrashed into the bargain that would not satisfy me at all and he left the room what an impudent scoundrel said the prince marshal hulot who had stood up throughout this scene as pale as a corpse studying his brother out of the corner of his eye went up to the prince and took his hand repeating in forty-eight hours the pecuniary mischief shall be repaired but honour good-bye marshal it is the last shot that kills yes i shall die of it he said in his ear what the devil brought you here this morning said the prince much moved i came to see what can be done for his wife replied the count pointing to his brother she is wanting bread especially now he has his pension it is pledged the devil must possess such a man said the prince with a shrug what philtre do those baggages give you to rob you of your wits he went on to hulot d'ervy how could you you who know the precise details with which in french offices everything is written down at full length consuming reams of paper to certify to the receipt or outlay of a few centimes you who have so often complained that a hundred signatures are needed for a mere trifle to discharge a soldier to buy a curry-comb how could you hope to conceal a theft for any length of time to say nothing of the newspapers and the envious and the people who would like to steal those women must rob you of your common sense do they cover your eyes with walnut shells or are you yourself made of different stuff from us you ought to have left the office as soon as you found that you were no longer a man but a temperament if you have complicated your crime with such gross folly you will end i will not say where promise me cotin that you will do what you can for her said the marshal who heard nothing and was still thinking of his sister-in-law depend on me said the minister thank you and good-bye then come monsieur he said to his brother the prince looked with apparent calmness at the two brothers so different in their demeanour conduct and character the brave man and the coward the ascetic and the profligate the honest man and the peculator and he said to himself 
that mean creature will not have courage to die and my poor hulot such an honest fellow has death in his knapsack i know he sat down again in his big chair and went on reading the dispatches from africa with a look characteristic at once of the coolness of a leader and of the pity roused by the sight of a battlefield for in reality no one is so humane as a soldier stern as he may seem in the icy determination acquired by the habit of fighting and so absolutely essential in the battlefield next morning some of the newspapers contained under various headings the following paragraphs monsieur le baron hulot d'ervy has applied for his retiring pension the unsatisfactory state of the algerian exchequer which has come out in consequence of the death and disappearance of two employees has had some share in this distinguished official's decision on hearing of the delinquencies of the agents whom he had unfortunately trusted monsieur le baron hulot had a paralytic stroke in the war minister's private room monsieur hulot d'ervy brother to the marshal comte de Fortsheim, has been forty-five years in the service his determination has been vainly opposed and is greatly regretted by all who know monsieur hulot whose private virtues are as conspicuous as his administrative capacity no one can have forgotten the devoted conduct of the commissary-general of the imperial guard at warsaw or the marvellous promptitude with which he organized supplies for the various sections of the army so suddenly required by napoleon in eighteen fifteen one more of the heroes of the empire is retiring from the stage monsieur le baron hulot has never ceased since eighteen thirty to be one of the guiding lights of the state council and of the war office algiers the case known as the forage supply case to which some of our contemporaries have given absurd prominence has been closed by the death of the chief culprit johann wisch has committed suicide in his cell his accomplice who had absconded will be sentenced in default wisch formerly an army contractor was an honest man and highly respected who could not survive the idea of having been the dupe of chardin the storekeeper who has disappeared and in the paris news the following paragraph appeared monsieur le marechal the minister of war to prevent the recurrence of such scandals for the future has arranged for a regular commissariat office in africa a head clerk in the war office monsieur marneffe is spoken of as likely to be appointed to the post of director the office vacated by baron hulot is the object of much ambition the appointment is promised it is said to monsieur le comte martial de la roche hugon deputy brother-in-law to monsieur le comte de rastignac monsieur massal master of appeals will fill his seat on the council of state and monsieur claude vignon becomes master of appeals of all kinds of false gossip the most dangerous for the opposition newspapers is the official bogus paragraph however keen journalists may be they are sometimes the voluntary or involuntary dupes of the cleverness of those who have risen from the ranks of the press like claude vignon to the higher realms of power the newspaper can only be circumvented by the journalist it may be said as a parody on a line by voltaire the paris news is never what the foolish folk believe 